Well, we praise and thank the Lord for the opportunity to worship with you today. For those that are here uh, in this assembly and also those that will join us later by the way of television and internet. Thank you for your faithfulness to worship with us and as we make our call for worship this morning, please join us in singing hymn number 80. Hymn number 80. Let's stand together as we sing. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Hymn number 305. Hymn number 305. Shall we stand together? Once like a bird in prison I dwell No freedom from my sorrow I fell But Jesus came and listened to me And glory to God He set me free He set me free set me free and he broke the bonds of prison for me and glory bound my Jesus to see for glory to God he set me free now I am climbing higher each day darkness of night has Drifted away, my feet are planted on higher ground, and glory to God, I'm homeward bound. He set me free, yes, He set me free, and He broke the bonds of prison for me.
Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. 
For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in earth, heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened by might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, and depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout, the, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Father, we're rejoicing this morning in knowing that you've touched us. We're rejoicing this morning in the witness of the Holy Spirit that's been in this service already, in our prayer service earlier, and then in this service. Father, teach us this morning what you'd have us to learn. Father, Lord, move in our hearts, change us this morning. May we be closer to you when we leave than we were when we came. Lord, change us that we might be more like you, love you more as you love us. Take the word of God and use it richly in our hearts. In Christ Jesus, amen. amen. In our text, written by Brother Paul, Apostle Paul, he's, record, he's recorded a prayer that he gave on our behalf, on behalf of all believers, that we would know completely the love of Christ. That's a task. You say, preacher, can we know completely the love of Christ? Amen, we can. You might think that it's an unattainable goal. You might think that it, I just can't get there in my life. But yes, you can. Paul in his heart believes that all believers in Christ Jesus can obtain it, can know completely, fully, the love of Christ in their heart, their love for him and his love for us. Holy Spirit leads Apostle Paul to put words down in a proper order that he would see fit. Paul would have us to measure the un unmeasurable or the immeasurable. To measure the love of Christ as we've never measured it before. But before one can measure the love of Christ, he must be fitted to do it. He must be prepared to do so. It's just not something that says, I love Christ. It's not just as simply as saying, Christ loves me and I love him. It's much more to the love of Christ than that. It's much more to our love for him than that. So he gives us the prescription this morning that we might know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. We might not be able to tell everybody but we'll know it's there. We might not be able to comprehend everything, but most of it we'll understand. So he tells us, first of all, that he's praying for us that we might know the love of Christ that passes all knowledge, comprehends knowledge. But he tells us, first of all, we must be trained to learn. We must be fitted for the, for the time of measurement. Paul prayed in verse 16, that he, God, would grant you according to his, the riches and his glory, that you be strengthened by the might of his spirit in the inner man. First of all, I want you to notice the basis for this prayer of the, knowing the love of God. It's based on the riches of his glory. It's not based on our works. It's not based on our intelligence, but it's based on what he has done, the riches of his glory, what he has in store for us. First of all, Paul prayed that our inner man would be energized and strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Your inward man, that inward part of you that has understanding, faith, hope, love, that inward man that's been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, that's been washed away, the sins of that inner man being washed away in the blood of Christ, made pure and perfect by his blood and by his love. He prays that that part of us that has faith, hope, and love we find a power source from a divine nature. We need that. We need a power source of divine nature in order to make it day by day in this world. 
He prays that we would be strengthened or made vigorous, alive, healthy, capable of working for him. He prays that we would be strengthened in the inner man or made alive, energized. We would be given power that only the Holy Spirit can give us with might, with might. Might is a great degree of force for which little is not enough. If you and I are going to accomplish anything for God, if you and I are going to know the fullness of his love, it has to be by the might of Holy Spirit, by the power that somebody else has, not ours. I want to tell you this morning, you and I have not the capability of having the power that we need within ourselves to do anything. And we can only do things through Christ which strengthens us. Paul said in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. But he gives us the fact that we need to be energized and made alive in our inward man, not by ourselves, but by the might of God delivered to us by the Holy Spirit. The power is needed, is spiritual. It needs to be heavenly, it needs to be holy, and it can only be rendered to us or imparted to us by the person of Holy Spirit. By the person of Holy Spirit. Sometimes people are afraid of the terminology Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. I want to see Holy Ghost power in our lives. I want to see Holy Ghost making a difference in our lives as he moves in, takes control, lives within us. We need the might of the Holy Spirit more than we need anything else in this church, more than we need anything else in ministry, more than we need anything else in our life. We need the leadership and guidance of Holy Spirit moving upon us that nobody else can do, giving to us what nobody else can do. And Paul prayed, not only would we would have be, our inner man be energized and strengthened, but that we would always have Christ before us. In verse, 30, verse 17, he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that Christ may always be in the forefront of our life, the center of our life, that Christ would be our life, that he would be everything and every, all, everything and to us and all things to us. And he placed it in a special part of our, of our inner man. He says that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. In your heart, love is learned to measure the love of Christ. In your heart is the place where love proceeds to, fight, to love Christ and where Christ's love dwells. It, that's the reason it wasn't delivered to our head. You know, our head is not the emotional part of our life. It's our heart that makes a difference. It's our hearts where we should be. It's our heart where the Holy Spirit delivers to the love of Christ and makes a difference in us. So he delivers it to our heart, not to our head. But how does he do it? How does he allow us to make to the carnal man to measure to measure the love of Christ by faith. You see, carnal men, carnal men walks by sight, measures things by sight. They look at things and say, well, if I can see it, I'll do it. If I can see it, I believe it. If I can see it, I'll understand it. But the saint of God doesn't walk by, by, light, by sight, but they walk by faith. We say by faith we can understand the love of Christ. By faith we can know he lives in our hearts. By faith we know we're saved and redeemed and washed in his blood. By faith we know we have security in Christ Jesus. By faith we know he's taking us one day to glory. By faith, saints measure the love of Christ. And then he says this, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. May dwell, may live. You see, Christ is ever near us that we might learn of him and measure his love. Christ is close to us. Christ is with us. You see, if he's not living in your heart, you're not saved. If he, through the Holy Spirit, has not took up abode and you've made him the king of your life, you're lost as lost can be. You're headed for an eternity in hell without Jesus Christ. But he needs to be living in our hearts. He needs to be ever dwelling there. And our love for him and our communion is based on this knowledge that he is here. You see, we listen to him speak to us through the word. He gives us word through our hearts. As we study the word of God, as the psalmist said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You see, the word of God is Christ alive in us that reminds us and tells us when we're wrong and shows us when we fail that we might not sin against him. It's the knowledge of communion with him which is based upon. Then thirdly, Paul prayed that we would learn the art of measurement or measuring the love of Christ. Look in verse 17 again. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. You see, we must love Christ ourselves if we're to know and measure his love. I mean, we're to love him ourselves 
if we didn't measure and know his love. I'm not saying just what the, just let it come off of your tongue. I love Jesus. I'm not saying just talk about it. I love Jesus. I'm saying it display with your life. I'm saying display with your faithfulness to him, your dedication to him, your, your completeness with him, your dependence upon him. Your love for him must be displayed in the life that we live, not in the tongue that we wag. We must love Christ ourselves. And we must, by the experience in his love, be confirmed, be grounded in his love for him, or we cannot measure his love for us. What are you saying, Pastor? Be sure that you love Jesus. Be grounded. Be firm in your matter. Nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. Nothing can stop me from loving my Jesus. Nothing's ever going to prevent me from loving my God. Nothing's ever going to hinder me from making him first and foremost in my life that I might know and measure his love completely. And we must have a firm grip on Christ. We must be like that tree planted by the river of water, rooted as a tree with its roots going down deep into the ground and becomes unmovable. Have you looked at a tree maybe in your yard or your neighbor's yard or somewhere you see so strong and tall and, and, and solid in the ground and you can't move it? Sandy and I had the privilege of going out to see the redwoods in Northern California one time. I mean, these trees that are hundreds and hundreds of feet tall, you look up to, from standing at the base of the tree and you can't see the top. And they've been there for thousands of years. Ever since creation, probably, they've been there. And they just grow and continue to grow and get big and round. And it'd take 15 or 20 of us to join hands and reach around those trees. That's what Christ expects us to do. If we're to know his love, we need to be grounded in him. If we're to know his love and to, and, and to measure his love and to understand his love, we need to become unmovable. We need to be standing firm in the grace of God. We need to be settled down in his love as a foundation of life, as we, as we need to be grounded as a building is set on a solid foundation. We don't need to be in the sinking sands of this world. We don't need to be blown about by winds, of, tossed about by winds of doctrine and winds of things that's not, not of God. But we need to be settled on our love for him. I love him. That's the fact. I love him. You're not going to change my mind. I love Jesus more than I love anybody else, anything else in my life. We must be there. We must show that fitness, that certainty, that perseverance of character, that belief, that desire, that faith, for it's the only way we can learn of Christ and who he is and his love for us. What a prayer Paul prayed for us. What instructions he gives us from the word of God. If you love his prayer for us, if you love his instructions, give him praise and glory in the house. So we see that we must learn Christ. We must love Christ. We must give him our all. We must give him everything of our life. If we hold back one little part of our life, we're not fully loving Christ. But he must be all in our life. We must give him everything that we have. Submit everything to his keeping. And then we can learn to measure. And only then can we learn to measure the love of Christ, which is seemingly unmeasurable by most people. Look in verse 18. That we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, and the height. In the sense of measuring, Paul uses four mathematical words that we'll look at in a minute. Four mathematical words he gives us as we'll break them down and look at them in a minute. Using these words and doing our measurement of Christ's love brings us to the reality of the matter. I mean, we can look and we can say we love God, but until we learn to dive into his love, sink ourselves deeply in his love, measure his love, we'll never have the reality of who he is. This morning when we leave this church, I want us to have a reality of his love. I want you to be without doubt of his love, in the depths of his love, and the height of his love, and the breadth of his love. I want us to know beyond any doubt his love completely in our heart. You see, this includes us coming near to him and studying his word, coming near to Christ himself. We need to desire to be close to him. Our desire should be close to him every day of our life. 
In order to measure this measurement, in order to do this measurement, Paul uses the same growth, growth pattern as we, he tells us that we need to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at these four, four mathematical words in the order that Holy Spirit gave them to Apostle Paul. I believe this is exactly how they need to be. The breath. He says that you might know the breath, the great, immense love of God, the greatly immense, beyond human understanding, beyond the understanding of mere mortal man, the breath, the taking of all nations and all people. Christ says in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, a great commission, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The breath of God's love takes in every man everywhere upon this universe in which we are in. It doesn't matter whether you're white, red, yellow, black, pink, purple, dark, or pony. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. It doesn't matter the education level you have. It doesn't matter where you live on what side of the track. It doesn't matter if you have a mansion or if you have a mobile home or if you live in a cardboard box like some people do. His love is so great, the breath of his love, it takes in all of humanity, every creature, every person. And it's our job who love him and know his love to preach the gospel of love to every creature. Don't escape, don't let anyone escape, don't exclude anyone, regardless who they are. We need to love them and preach the gospel to them. All men are who Christ died for. All men have the opportunity to be saved. He, his love is so great that it covers all men. His love is so great, the breath of his love is so great that it takes in a host of iniquities. Matter of fact, it takes in all of our iniquities and all of our sins. Listen to, listen to this in Matthew 12, 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all matter of sin and blaspheming shall be forgiven unto men, but the blaspheming against the Holy Ghost of God shall not be forgiven unto men. God says, Christ says, all your sin I forgave at Calvary. All your sins I removed, all your iniquities I removed. It takes in all of our iniquities. You say, preacher, you don't understand. You don't know where I've been. No, you just don't know the riches of his love. You say, you don't know what I've done. You don't know who I've done it to. No, you just don't understand the riches of his grace, the riches of his love, the greatness and the breadth of his love. I want to tell you this morning, we need to get off of our pride-filled attitudes and say this, if God can save me, he can save anybody. Amen. Apostle Paul said he was the chiefest of sinners. David said he raised me up out of the lower reams of hell. I'm going to tell you this morning, if God can save me and he can save you, he can save every person on the face of this earth. And that's who he died for. It, composed, it, it con contains or it, it covers the host of our iniquities. And it, con it compasses all of our needs. It compasses all of our, The breath of his love compasses all of our needs. Listen to Paul's writing in 14, 19 of the book of Philippians. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You say, all my needs? Yes, he will. He'll supply all your needs on time, right on time, not before, and he's not early and he's not late, but he'll meet every need that you have on time. He said he would. Now, what's, his, what's his, our needs being met based on? How good we are? No. How good we live? No. But it's based on the riches of glory by Christ Jesus. And then he brings reality of his care for us. He brings into reality of his care for us. If you ever, ever, ever understand this one statement that he made, it's amazing. Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care on him, for he careth for you. Is there anything that you can't cast on Jesus? Is there any part of your life you can't cast on Jesus? Is there anything that you have you can't give to him? No, but you ought to give him everything you have. You ought to cast all your cares, all your worries, all your heartaches, all your sickness, all, your sh all, all the things that you have, all your problems of life. Why? He cares for you. Nobody ever cared for me like Jesus. Nobody ever cared for you like Jesus. Nobody ever will care for us like Jesus. And he tells us, come and cast our cares on him. What a Savior we have. What a wonderful Savior. What a wonderful Lord. What a wonderful Redeemer. Why well, give him praise and glory for his wonderfulness this morning. The second term that he uses after breath is length. Eternal, never ending. Eternal, never to know an end. 
the length of his love will never end. It will never die. His love is always there. It's always rich for us. We wonder why God should love us all. You ever wondered why God should love you? Amen. We should wonder why God should love us. But he did because he sent his son to die on the cross of Calvary. But we need to look closer at the love of God to understand why he loved us and how much he loves us and it's never-ending love he has. You see, his love is an eternal fountain flowing towards us. He says that we have rivers of living water boiling up inside of us. That's the love of God. That's the love of Christ for us. Those rivers will always be refreshing. They'll always be there. His love is flowing continually for us. His love for us is never-ending in the fact that he chose us to, to himself and gives us a covenant relationship with, it, with him. God gave Adam a covenant relationship. He gave Moses a covenant relationship. But coming to the age of grace, he gives sinners who believe in him and become saints a covenant relationship. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll go with you to the end of the age. He says, if you have any needs, cast them on me. If you have any desires, let me know about it. He says, because I'm here for you. Aren't you glad that we have such a relationship with Christ that we can say hello and he listens? Aren't you glad we have such a relationship with the Father we can say hello Father, it's me, and he knows who we are. And we, when we get down and out and out and down, and when we have problems and trials, Holy Spirit, the third person in the Godhead, just moves in us and comforts, comforts us like nobody else can comfort us. Oh, that's a relationship that's special. That's a relationship that's wonderful. Nobody else you have a relationship with like that. Not even your husband or your wife that you have that relationship with. Not your children, not your sons or your daughters, not your mom or your dad. Nobody else can have a relationship like you have with Jesus Christ. The ceaseless flow of his love, it never ends. It's always there. His love is endless and it, his love endures all things. All things. You know, there's times in my life, even as a Christian, I wonder, how could God love me? How could Jesus love me the way I am today? You see, it might be surprising to you, but I'm not perfect. Well, I got news for you. You aren't either. It might be surprising to you. I, I have sinned in my life occasionally. I got news for you. You have sinned in your life occasionally. But that doesn't stop Christ loving us. He endures our sins. He forgives us. The word of God says in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he'll be faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and cleanse us from all iniquities, all unrighteousness. You see, his love endures us. You might have a hard time enduring me. You probably do sometimes. But Christ never has a hard time enduring his, his children. Christ never has a hard time enduring his saints. He endures all things. His love for us is long-suffering and full of forgiveness. Long-suffering full of forgiveness. You see, my God is long-suffering to us that not any should perish, but all should come to, to come into repentance. His love for you and I is long-suffering. Oh, we might not always show him the love that we need to show him. He always loves, shows us the love that we need, to, he needs, we need to see in him. And he's full of forgiveness. I'm so glad not only did he forgive me for my sin at Calvary, but he forgave that sin of rebellion, sin of disbelief, and I come to know him, he still forgives me my sins. And his love is full of redemption, faithful, unchanging, and patience. You see, nobody else could pay the price of redemption for us like Jesus paid. There was no other perfect lamb than Jesus. There was no other perfect sacrifice than the lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. He brings us to himself in redemption. He's faithful to us. Even when we are unfaithful to him, he's faithful to us. And he's always patient. I'm the most impatient person in the world. Now, you don't have to say amen, but it's true. I want things done yesterday today. I want things done today should have been done yesterday. I mean, I'm impatient. I'm impatient with myself. I'm impatient with people. But I'm so glad God's not impatient with me. I'm so glad he's long-suffering and gentle and kind, full of goodness and mercy to us as we need him to be. You see, his love is boundless. The length, of, the length is exceeding the length of our sin. It exceeds the length of our suffering, our backsliding. It even goes longer than our age and it exceeds the temptation that we face. Oh, God's love for us is great in its length and everlasting. If you know that everlasting love of God and his enduring patience with us, give him praise and glory.
And then we find not just the breadth and the length, but we find the depth of his love. To most, it's incomprehensible. To our little weak minds, we think we, can, we could never know the depth of his love. But listen to the depth of his love. It brought himself to bring to us. Christ himself brought himself to earth to bring to us his divine love to fallen men. You see, he condescends to us, to our lowest state. He left heaven's glory. He left the splendor of the Father's house. He disrobed himself of his royalty, took on himself the form of flesh, the form of sinful man. But he lived a perfect life and endured the sufferings we went through, endured the hardships, the temptations we went through. He endures all things. You say, preacher, I have such a headache you just don't understand. Take it to Jesus. He can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, Paul writes in Hebrews. You say, preacher, I've got this problem. Take it to Jesus. He endured the same thing you endured. He'll give you strength to go through it. You say, preacher, you don't understand where I'm at and what I'm doing. God does. Christ does because he's already walked before us in the path of this life. You see, his depth to us is unsearchable. His receiving us and bearing our faults and our sins and our iniquities. He who took our sins on himself, took our iniquities on himself, went to the cross of Calvary and it pleased the Father that he bear our sins on the cross, that he was beaten for our iniquity and which by his stripes we are healed, taking us from such a lowest state of hell, making us his own, giving us heaven, giving us an eternity with him. You see, he, le he left heaven, became incarnate, endures our sorrows, bears our sins, suffers our shame and our death. He took my death on the cross of Calvary. You see, in all honesty of the matter, we all should die at Calvary. And in the reality of the matter, we all died at Calvary because we're dead in Christ, but we're alive in Christ Jesus. So what do we get from this measurement of his depth, of his love? What do we see? What do we find in measuring the depth of his love? We see our weakness. We see our meanness. We see our sinfulness. We see our iniquities. We see our faults. We see our failures. And we, as Isaiah could say, woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. Woe is me, he said, when he saw God high and lifted up. That's what we'll see if we'll measure his love, the depths of his love. We'll see his glory. We'll see his holiness. We'll see his greatness. We'll see his deity. And we'll see the only Savior of mankind, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, how great is the depth of his love. How great is the depth of his love that he left heaven, came to earth, that we might not leave earth and go to hell, but we would have salvation in Christ Jesus, leave earth and go to heaven. If you're looking forward to the greatness of his, the depths of his love, if you're enjoying what he's done for you, you're looking forward to heaven. Give him praise and glory. Then we see not just the length and the breadth and the depth, but we see the height of his love. It's infinite, it's unknowing, it's unchanging, it's un almost unmeasurable. The present, we see the present privilege of being at one with Jesus Christ. Listen to this, the present privilege of being at one with Jesus Christ. At one time, we had to dis privilege, we had the horror of being at one with Satan. You say, I was at one with Satan. Yeah, he was leading us around, taking us where he wanted us to go, causing us to do the things he wanted us to do. He was there. We might not like to admit it, but we followed him. But then came Jesus. Stood in my way between me and hell. There came Jesus standing there in my way between me and hell looked at us and said, hey, listen, listen, sinners. I created you. You left me. I came to this world to die for you. I died for you on the cross of Calvary. I forgave your sins. All you need to do is believe and accept. And I'll walk with you. I'll be there. You see, he reveals to us the pre present privilege of walking with him. Aren't you glad this, this morning that you'll never walk alone again? I remember that song, I'll Never Walk Alone. As long as Jesus is with me, and that's forever, because he came into my heart to stay, I'll never walk alone. As long as he's with me, I'll never be lonely. 
because he's always there. Oh, people may forsake you and people may go their ways and people may leave you for a while, but he'll never leave you. He says, I'll never leave you. I'll be with you all the way. I'll stay with you till the end of the age. Aren't you glad for that? He says, I came to take up my abode with you, to walk with you. I think about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day when God the Father would come and walk with them, talk with them, and commune with them. Then I think about Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed to his father that the cup would pass from him and his sweat become his great drops of blood. He'd done that for us. Why? That we might walk in the garden with him. You see, every day we can wake up and say, Hello, Jesus. Every day we can walk with him and hold his hand and he holds our hand. Every day we can talk to him anytime we want to, anytime we have a desire. And he can talk to us. And when he talks to us, we need to listen. When he gives us some word from 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 our heart that we've hid in our heart, the Word of God. And when the Holy Spirit brings it back to our heart, that's Christ talking with us. We need to heed His Word. What a joy it is to walk with Jesus. Are you enjoying walking with Jesus this morning? Are you enjoying knowing that He's your Lord and Savior? And then, what a privilege, what a high privilege it is that He tells us we are to be revealed with Him in future glory. Oh, we're to share in His glory. We're to share in His joy. We're to share in heaven forever. One day I was headed for hell. Then I met Jesus. He changed me completely. He turned my life around. He changed the man I used to be. He took that old man and took him off and put on the new man. And he made me his own. He's still working on me. He's still working on you. But one of these days we're going to be revealed for him in future glory. One of these days, and it could be today, he'll split those eastern skies. He'll come back to rapture his church. And we who are alive and remain here on this earth, he will hear him say, come up hither, as we find in Revelation chapter 4. And we're leaving this world in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. We're going to be lifted out of here. And we're going to have glory beyond glory. I'm anxious to see what heaven's like. You see, over in the book of Revelations, we have a description of heaven. But that's just building material. What heaven is is where Jesus is. What heaven, what's heaven going to be is where Jesus is. I'm anxious to, to walk with him personally. Hold his hand in heaven. Listen to him teach us there. Listen to him give us all the things that we need. Supply all of our needs. Take care of us in heaven. Give us glory beyond glory, which is incomprehensible now. In his height, the height of his love. Causes us that we might be fully comprehend throughout the ages of eternity to come. His love. You see, his height of his love is a learning experience that he shares with us. Paul writes to the church of Ephesus and says this in chapter 3 and verse 7, that, he might, in age, that, that in the ages to come, he might show us the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness to us. And his kindness to us. His love to us. He shares it with us every day. We know his love every day. We see and we feel and we comprehend his love every day. We enjoy and walk in his love every day. But there's coming a time that in the eons of times to come, in the ages to come, time without end, we will be with him. Oh, I'm looking forward to that day. As, as John said, even so come, Lord Jesus. Even so come, Lord Jesus. I'm looking for that day that he's going to show me through the ceaseless ages of time the riches of his grace and of his kindness to us. The riches of his grace, the riches of his love, the riches of his mercy, the riches of his salvation, he'll continually show us throughout the ceaseless ages of time. You see, when we've been there a thousand years, we'll just begin to praise him. We'll just begin to learn of what all he's done for us and what all he has for us. My, what a savior. What a blessing he gives us today and the ages to come. If you're enjoying his blessings today and looking forward to future blessings throughout the ceaseless ages of time, praise him this morning. So we have learned by Holy Spirit's leadership under the authorship of Paul, penmanship of Paul, the love of God, his length, his breadth, his depth, his height. What a love. But we need to learn something from his love. There's a result of knowing the love of Christ. 
This is the reason that he wants us to measure his love. This is the reason he wants us to comprehend his love, to understand his love. You see, there's a result that we get from measuring the love of Christ. Look at verse 19 of our text. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Let me read that again. And to know now, right now, the love of Christ which passes knowledge, our understanding. It goes beyond what we humanly could understand. Spiritually we do. That we might be filled with all the goodness, with all the fullness of God. The results of this measurement taking is amazing and wondered, wonderful to be pondered, to be thought about. He says here that the results of taking this measurement is that we might be filled, that we might be filled. It's amazing to me the things that a redeemed person can hold in their heart and in their knowledge of him. It's amazing to me. When, when you and I first come to know Christ as our Savior, the only thing that we knew was we were lost. He died for us. We accepted his death. We accepted him as our Savior. And that was it. Pretty much that was it. But over the years of knowing him as our Savior and seeing his love manifested to us, we have learned to grow in his love, to hold in our hearts things that we never believed we could hold before. The blessings, the glory, the faith, the, the knowledge we hold in our heart because of his love. We are filled with his love. We are filled with his knowledge. We are filled with his redemption. We are filled of all of him. He said not only be filled, but filled with God. Filled with God. I'm so glad that God lives and dwells within us in the, Holy, with the person of the Holy Spirit. Paul writes to the, first, to the church of Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and he says this, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God? For ye are not your own. Can you imagine growing in God to the extent that he fills your person, he fills your inward man of, by, with himself? Now, we seem to fill our minds with all the things of this world. I mean, it's easy to fill our minds with the things of this world. Just ride down the road and look at some of these billboards that are so nasty and vulgar. Just turn your TV channel by channel and see what's on there. Listen to the radio and some of the music that's played. It just fills our mind with the things of this world but his love fills our heart. His love fills our heart with who? With himself and the person of the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He fills us. We are filled with the goodness of God. We are filled with the goodness of God. And, know, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. We are filled with the goodness of God. We are filled with all the goodness of God. Every bit of his goodness we find Paul writing to, Romans and Romans, to the Romans in 15, 14, and he says, And I myself am also persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, are able to admonish one another. Aren't you glad that God just doesn't remove sin, but he fills us with himself? You see, when we get saved, this is how it is. We see ourselves a sinner, lost and headed for hell. We see Jesus in his glory in his majesty, in his greatness, but in his suffering, in his, in his sacrificial gift to us. We see him for who he is. And we say yes to Jesus. Well, let me tell you this. Only one person can abide in your heart at one time. That's where satanic spirits were dwelling. But when Jesus come in, he kicked them out. You said, no, I did. No, Jesus kicked them out. He said, get out of here. This is my child. Get out of here. This is my redeemed. This is my beloved. You're not welcome here anymore. The devil's not welcome in our life anymore because Holy Spirit comes in and fills us with the goodness of God. You see, he changes our life. When he moves in and takes control, he changes our life. The Word of God says that there's not one without sin. Well, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not one that doeth good. No, not one. But when Jesus comes in, he brings his goodness. He brings his grace. He brings his mercy. He brings his forgiveness. He brings his love that we might show to others. You see, we who had no goodness, 
of our own now has the goodness of the Savior. We who had no grace now has the grace of God. We had no mercy to offer now have the mercy of salvation in Christ Jesus. And we show it to others. If you're so thankful for the amazing God that we have that fills us with himself, give him praise and glory. Measuring the love of Christ with heavenly math will lead you to comprehend and completely know the completeness of his love. Not just think about it, but know it. Live it every day of your life. For the believer, it will cause us to love Christ, our love for Christ to be broad and long and deep and high. For a believer, his love will cause, cause us to love others, regardless who they are and where they are. With his love, knowing his, the fullness of his love, we can't keep it to ourselves, but we must share it with everybody we meet. That's the direction he gives us. Let me ask you this morning, have you measured Christ's love and do you know him as your savior? Have you measured Christ's love and come to love him greatly? Have you measured his love to the extent that you know that there's no way you can get by, get apart from his love, be separated from his love? Let me just read you a verse of scripture or two here concerning his love. Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 8, verse 35, we'll begin in 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Question. Who or what can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? No. Shall distress? No. Shall persecution? No. Famine? No. Nakedness? No. Pearl? No. Sword, no. As it is written, for thy sake, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sleep sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Amen. More than conquerors. We have victory in Jesus. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angel, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come. Listen to this nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you love him this morning? You love him because you, he first loved you, us. Do you love him this morning? Give him praise and glory in his house. What great love we've measured this morning. What great love we know this morning because he loved us and gave himself for us. This morning, the invitation is Jack and the ladies come. You might want to come and say, thank you for your love. As a saint of God, as a Christian, you might want to bow on this altar and say, thank you for the love. Thank you for teaching me to measure your love and help me to love others as you love me. You may be here this morning and you don't know the love of Christ. You're lost. You've never come to know him as your savior. He stands waiting to give you his love, the completeness of his love. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, Take this message and use it for your glory. May we know completely and fully the love that you have for us, the love of Christ. Move in the hearts of your people, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.